Uh, if I have time, I'll make some remark about this ridiculous title. But not now, because I want to quickly review an argument I've been making for a couple of years and every few days, including recent talks, uh, saying the argument's right. Um, Maybe, in the case I seem to be getting off the point, it's all heading toward a discussion of why a depressing discussion, <coughs> discussion of the so-called cancer problem. I don't want to know. Uh, okay, so anyway, let me see. Okay. Yes, okay, so. <laughs> this is the opposite from the top, most of the talks you've heard. The modern way to do science is, of course, blah, blah, so on. This is the old-fashioned way. Think small, talk big. How do we do that? We look at classical models, and as we know from Popper, they can tell us more than we first thought. So let's take the world's simplest reaction. It happens to involve transcription, but everything I'm about to say could have been figured out from studying other systems. Here's a gene. We have a gene and RNA polymerase. Huh? Now, with a certain frequency, RNA polymerase will bind the gene and transcribe it. Genes are always on, more or less. There's no such right? unless something is done to stop it. What does it mean if we want to now do so? so for example, if that were the lac gene, the E. coli would be lac plus. And one of the themes, in case I forget, one of the themes of the talk is that the reason molecular biology is so complicated is not because the underlying reactions are so complicated, but because they're so simple. And in fact, therefore, what, what, what has happened, ignoring the chemistry from go by and so on, uh, natural selection has added add-ons that make systems that work, work better. And did I say, Darwin was looking at the simplest problem, the, the elaboration of animals and plants. That's, it turns out to be a trivial problem. And no new enzymes, basically known in chemistry, just using stuff you find around the house. And Darwin would know about bacteria and all this stuff. Then hopeless. Okay, so now we're going to use the fancy phrase activate the gene. How do you activate the gene? Well, you use a, is there a, yeah, this thing's called an activator. It's simply another protein that binds to this site, simultaneously touching the polymerase. It can touch anywhere. And we say that this recruits the polymerase to the gene. And now an event that happens at a certain frequency happens more frequently. It's not a big deal. It's a factor of 10 to 50, trivial in chemical terms, a kilocalorie or two, and in fact, the, the kinds of interactions that are involved in one or two amino acids, almost every things, dignity. But already, actually, already we know the general answer. We stop right here. The general answer is, let's just re rephrase this problem and kind of redraw the thing, and we say, I could have said polymerase, it can be the transcriptional machinery, and eukaryotes, this whole complicated thing, doesn't matter. What happens is that the activator is a protein, and we, it binds to one site, it binds the machinery, brings the machinery to the gene. The machinery, or let us say the polymerase, has many possible substrates, many possible genes it can work on. Which it works on is determined by a binding reaction. The binding reaction involves little energy and is simple to do. And if you want to change this activator, for example, the typical transcriptional activator in carrots will work on any gene. You just have to put it in front of that gene, and it will recruit the machinery. Now, this turns out to be true if you think of it for a moment about all the enzymes molecular biologists study, as opposed to those who study intermediate metabolism. Uh, the ubiquitolases, we'll see, the kinases, the phosphatases, the, all the polymerases, the RNA splicing enzymes, the his own modification enzyme. Ah, no, no, no. These are all enzymes with no inherent specificity in the sense that they can work on many different subjects. And which they work on is determined by a binding reaction. So it's the simplest, the simplest and possible work, uh, simplest and nerdiest way to evolve these systems is by using these recruiters. And what mostly changes in evolution are the recruiters. We have the same enzymes basically as a flock. It's where the enzymes work at any given time. If this were E3 and E2, for example, the E3 would bring in so and so forth. You're familiar with this. What's amazing is how general this is. 
SIRNAs, for example, what are they? They're simply recruiters that attach the machinery to the, uh, to the particular RNA. And dosage compensation, a hugely complicated problem. It amounts to saying we make a recruiter in the male, not the female, and it brings. So those of you who know what I mean, I just want to say, I've written this all out so you can go look at one. That, that a huge amount of complexity devolves to getting these recruiters to work at the right time in the right place. Now, <clears throat> Uh, by the way, I wanted a presenter's tool. Can't do that on this? Uh, forget it. Okay, forget it. Oop, no, what am I doing? Um, <laughs> oh my god. Uh, all right, forget the presenter. Yeah, okay, good. Ah. So, now, these elementary systems, just as Darwin said amazingly, you need add-ons. The add-ons are things that make systems that work, work better. So I just said, transcription, <laughs> no big deal. You add an activator, it works a little better. So you could control the recruiter, so you turn the gene on. Small effects, small chemical effects, but that's the world we're living in, the world of regulation. There are two problems. Well, let us now say, typical add-ons are there to ensure, first of all, specificity. So for example, this, this DNA binding protein will have a problem saying this site and not a lot of other sites. And so to make it better, we use cooperativity. And in fact, as you probably know, in all, all genes are regulated this way. You always have, sometimes you use integrated signals. But you very rarely find a single protein level. And Pat just mentioned that even in the RNA, in the RNA case, you might have imagined you could do away with it because you have structures, but even there, you probably, maybe, I don't know. Uh, use co-op. So it's a very, it's a fundamental thing. Now, if you're going to use, so here's, for example, um, Shankar probably showed you something that completely bewildered you, right? But what really is happening is that um, these guys have bound cooperatively. There's a little touch here, a little touch here. Now this gene has turned up. And this happens with very high accuracy. In fact, actually, Shankar, I'm sure, showed you that there are even more interactions, but they're all binding interactions all easy to do, all involving a few amino acids, all helping to ensure specificity. Now there's an interesting problem with binding reactions, namely, specificity, for example, cooperativity, depends on concentrations being below a certain level. If you raise the concentration, these small differences are going to disappear. The one or two kilocalories of interaction energy won't matter anymore, and these proteins will mark to a lot of sites. So in fact, back to the lambda case, we see how you do this. You make a protein which binds back to a weak site, which turns down transcription, so that the concentration of this protein never gets above a certain level. This is, these are perfectly general principles that must work for all binding reactions, all the systems that are run by binding reactions. Incidentally, you'll notice that this thing happens not only to be a repressor, but also to activate itself. And so this is an auto-regulatory loop an epigenetic state which is maintained. This is, I'll just say it, I mean, it's almost embarrassing at this point, but you know, it's one of the few really important ideas in biology. You don't need to have a computer, you don't need a system. Using simple binding reactions, you can create these self-perpetuating states. And uh, more and more developmental systems is, are being, is being realized that the end state of the developmental process is this auto-regulatory sort of loop called an epigenetic change, because it's self-perpetuating. Rick mentioned a couple. And it's just, it's just sad that the word epigenetic is so preposterously misused, so it's confused this important idea. If you want to talk more about it. Uh, I okay. I, I want to emphasize, you don't need to know this stuff in detail, I just want to emphasize that I'm serious when I say these features are add-ons. So here's a, this is a switch, as some of you know, Lambda can live in too much, either this way or that way. And it turns out that if you eliminate certain things, for example, you eliminate this autogenous negative regulation, or you eliminate even the positive activation of itself, or to some extent, even the cooperativity, what happens is the switch continues to work. It just doesn't work as well. It just is Imagine we're somehow measuring the efficiency with which the switch works. If you knock out one of these functions, it just doesn't make the switch as efficiently. And this seems to me, you know, something people, 
they like to talk about redundancy. Well, I don't know, but developmental systems are built by anon after anon after anon. And if you start taking them off, as you do in your Western typical, mut typical mutant, you get partial effects. You take away too many, it gets worse. This is any developmental biology. We have a mutant, and the moon doesn't heal, but then we wait a day or two, it does heal. Well, that mutant was in something that made it heal faster. Because that, that's what all these things work. Because they are so, they're not like Ferrari engines that get switched on and off. They're these crude systems that are built from these things. So now, knowing just this, what would you, what's the story with cancer? Well, cancer, everyone says, is signaling gone awry. So then we have to ask, what a signal. What is a typical signal transduction pathway? And here, amazing to me, I guess when I first realized it, all a signal transduction pathway is, is a series of steps, sometimes many steps, each of which involves a binding action of the sort we've been talking about. And there's one further crucial point that greatly simplifies your thinking, one's thinking about the whole problem. All the enzymes that are involved in signal transduction have only one function, that is to make or break a binding cycle. So for example, kinases, whether they're of the uh, two kinds, doesn't matter. You just what you're doing is making a binding cycle. Phosphatases, make a binding cycle or take it away. Rats, all the, the I mean sorry, sauce, all these things. What they do is work on the small GT proteins to change them so that they expose a binding site. There's a lot of mystical nonsense about this stuff, but that's all they are. If anyone challenges that, yeah, we'd love that. Uh, happy to hear it. So uh, if we had time, we'd go through a slightly hypothetical thing. And what you'd see is, this is a, this is a signal transduction pathway. Uh, uh, growth hormone is bound, and this and this, and there's a whole series of things. You see these things all the time. We're going to talk about this in a little bit more until we end up with the mother of all binding reactions, namely TRTs. Uh, the specificity of, you could put it this way, specificity of the protein assembly, what's that enzyme called? The hooks and amino acids together. Is it determined, right, is determined by binding reactions, binding of the triplets. It's profoundly, it seems everywhere in molecular biology. So, I don't know, do you want to go through any of this? Or, I don't want to spend it. But for example, these two gizmos, the receptor, all the, all the, all the ligand doesn't bring the chains together. That causes automatically phosphorylation of these sites, which in turn attracts uh, something that has SOS attached to it. SOS then works on RAS and just changes conformation so that now it's a binder. Now it binds a kinase, the kinase changes PIP1 to PIP3, that now binds a, uh, another kinase and on and on it goes. And if you follow it all the way through, and if you don't believe me, look at the amount of stuff in term biology, every step depends on a binding action. Therefore, every step is subject to the same problems that of imposing specificity and concentration, all this stuff that we have in any such kind of binding reaction. Now, there's one, so I mentioned cooperativity, concentration control. There's one other thing that's so prevalent, people lose sight of it because it's everywhere. Any system, you know, people talk, I won't say systems biologists, it's, you know, people love to talk, you know, should we say that? And everything's talking to everything. The way the world works is, nature is trying to make these dumb reactions specific. That means preventing them from doing what they shouldn't do, except when under, when required to do so. So any kinase will work, right? So, so what you have all through these systems, and the more they're studied, the more they come up. You have inhibitors that prevent the reaction from occurring spontaneously. Or, right, so, for, so here's for example, I don't know, in the millions of them, but anyway, here's an inhibitor that binds to this thing that keeps, even if it's this thing from getting phosphorylated. Uh, the concentration, of course, of these chains must be kept low, otherwise they will spontaneously, that's what happens in, right? Um, there are things that keep the chains apart. These inhibitors all have to have the form that they keep the thing from working unless it's supposed to work. And there are various ways to do that. One of the you know, amazing ways is the kinases. A lot of the kinases fold up so that they're inactive. 
Now they become active goal when they see the target by virtue of seeing the SH3 so on and so forth. The cyclone dependent kinases are all, they're so dangerous kinases that you need these mechanisms. But a lot of this complexity is just to keep ion reactions that otherwise would happen from happening. If you, I'll just say, there is one case in bacteria where you don't work quite this way, where you have a real polymerase that's really stuck and it really needs energy to be activated, and there you don't have any inhibitors because it's just, it's never, there's no basal level. All reactions that are based on binding, which is almost everything in the eukaryotic world in regulation, I'm saying, of course, what do I know? But I'm saying it anyway. So they, <laughs> all of those, need these kinds of, that's one of the reasons the world might get so complicated. So now we'll just think a minute about what is cancer. Why, uh, I could, but really want to make it, why, do, why are these guys in here give talks about the cancer genomes? You know, we're going to figure out this and we're going to, everybody's going to, you listen to their talks and of course, it's a complete blizzard. Nobody can figure out what's going on. There are a couple of, you know, and the reason is, of course, that this is evolution, and what, what happens is you start to lose this, you start to lose that, you start to lose this, and the systems not only fall apart, if you want to say that, but you also change specificities. So, for example, you overproduce, lots of things are overproduced. Well, what do you think happens when you overproduce a transcription factor? Of course, it binds to the wrong sites. What happens so so forth? And in fact, if you look through Weinberg's book, is furious when I told him this. Every one of these, the things he calls a cancer gene, is fits this description. They're either recruiters, they're inhibitors, they're anti-inhibitors, or they're enzymes that make and break binding sites. Very often overproduced, very often you have fusions that impart new specificities to enzymes. And so it's not, so anyway, uh, I have a whole list here, I mean, you know. But all these mysterious things, MDM2, is an inhibitor of P53, just simply a binding. Ours is an anti-inhibitor. Well, you, make, you overproduce one, you overproduce the other, you lose one, you lose the other, you see you have these consequences. In any given case, they might not be huge, but you accumulate them, and pretty soon it becomes catastrophic. So I'm going to skip all this because uh, it's almost baby talk once you realize the nature. And I think that, it's my view, I think, but even now when I read the the arguments from the sequencers who want another $100 million to do another $100 million sequencer. The argument is that there are key cancer genes, and we're going to find those genes. And of course, all the evidence is to the contrary. We find a lot, and in fact, this is what, the, what's his name? John Hopkins. Doesn't go out on Saturdays. What was he? I deal with him. It took six months before he could so I was completely out of my mind. But anyway, he had said this, or, and here's another case, and I think this is an honest take of what's actually done, and I don't think it's surprising, and I think it's only surprising if you have some other view influenced by our language and talks something about how the molecular world works. The amazing thing is not that, ah, it's not aging in my view, but it works in the first place. And you see what has to be done. So, but on the other hand, you see how easy it was to do. All you have to do is swap things around and change binding to increasing. You have new transduction pathways, and you have new signals turning on old genes, and so on. So very easy to do, but terribly easy to redirect. Okay, now I want to tell you, have I got any time? How much time do I have? Six minutes and 22 seconds. <laughs> so now I want to tell you, um, uh, something that's unpublished, I think is quite, it, it is quite something. So, okay. So, um, and I guess I better say this, because Rick, you know, he's a nice guy. But he goes around saying our view of gene regulation has changed because there is a, sometimes a polymerase stuck in a gene. Well, I think the, the point is that the same activator that we know recruits stuff activates that gene. So, obviously something's stuck there and it can't work because something else has to be recruited. So the logic is the same. And in fact, listen to it occurred to me, the stuck polymerase could be another way of inhibiting the basal level. Because if it's stuck, it's stuck. So it may be no more important than that. I don't know if there's any biological importance to it other than that or even that, but that's another matter. Okay.
It doesn't change our fundamental thinking. The nucleosome problem. Ah, well, DNA you know is wrapped in nucleosomes. And there are people who seriously believe that gene regulation is determined by chromatin architecture, namely the distribution of nucleosomes along the DNA. A paper appeared recently in Nature, which I took out this, but the summary ends up by saying, if you reconstitute nucleosomes in vitro, you get the in vivo pattern, and that shows that there's a basic way that nucleosomes can determine whether you can activate a gene. Amusingly enough, another paper appeared from someone I know who was submitted, and the editors, of course, said, and which said, this is completely wrong, <laughs> the experiment's badly, and then the editors said, well, it's nothing new, so they wouldn't publish it. It says, oh, there's some else, marvelous scientific stuff. So, it is a hard thing to get at this, but, but I'm going to just now tell you. So, so, here's an activator, let's say GAL4, which works on any gene in any organism, if you put a binding site for it. And it's got this formidable task, it's got to recruit, you know, it triggers recruitment of all this junk. But I just want to point out that there are often, we've all over the place, these things called nucleosomes, which are bigger than what's indicated here. So what, where are they, and what determines where they are, and what difference does it make? How do you deal with that problem? You could try reading the literature, but you'd be a dead man lady before you got anywhere near the end. So, you're going to have to look it up. A uh, guy in our lab, Gene Bryant, developed a new method for determining the disposition of nucleosomes on DNA that not only tells you very high accuracy where they are, it also tells you the fraction of the population that has a nucleosome at that site. So is it 50% there? No, we, okay. So you can look it up. It's in plus. So here, uh, after a big huff and puff, here's what the situation is at this yeast gene the GAL1, GAL10 genes, here's the UASG, the upstream active GAL4 binds here, and if you protect with nuclease, you find there's a nucleosome here, a nucleosome here, these are called promoter nucleosomes. You'll notice their size. There's one here. This is when the gene is inactive. This is a mysterious thing. I'm going to come back to it in a minute. Okay, what happens? Well, when you induce, the nucleosomes get taken away. They get taken away because GAL4 recruits in a binding reaction. The enzyme switch sniff, and no, not, no other mutant will affect the, 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 free, the rapidity of this process. Again, it's an add-on. If you don't have switch sniff, you activate the gene fine. It just takes longer. So, you know, there are these discussions about, my God, it takes a long time to make an IPS cell into a thing. And Yanish thinks that there's some person in there remodeling growing construction. I mean, if you just measured overnight, you'd never know this would be necessary. <laughs> but it gets even more. Okay, you can put, by the way, the UASG anywhere in the genome. And sure enough, you get these phase nucleosomes. And now you activate and galactose, so GAL4 works, takes off the nucleosome. So already, we've accounted for phase nucleosomes, which are, have, have a lot of erotic vibrations, and these rather long things called nucleosome-free regions. They're just regions from which the gene is being activated, the nucleosomes are taken off, as Horns pointed out long ago. Here's another representation of the same thing. Before induction, there are these nucleosomes, rather precisely positioned, you induce and boom, 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 you can follow this. These get taken away. The reason I show you this is to point out that the UASG, nothing happens. It's completely amazing. And this just completely therapeutic us for a year. Because the only thing we think that can protect DNA from a from microcochlear release is a nucleosome. But how could a nucleosome be sitting there? which is where GAL4 binds. And by the way, GAL4 is absolutely unnecessary to make this protective thing. And so we got it wrong at first. So what is at the UASG? Well, our new fancy technique said, and of course, you know, usually that's why we leave it, that the size is too small. The size that's protected is too small to be in the result. So 165 is everywhere. It's 100% occupied. There's very efficient protection, and it doesn't depend on GAL4. So am I done? OK, I'm just going to tell you the answer. Beautiful experiments, but I can't. The answer goes like this. Some years ago, Asturias in Kornberg's lab, I think that in Kornberg's lab, showed that there's a protein called RISC, which um, can bind to a mononucleosome 
and partly unwind it. So this is about any base pair center, I think. Risk is often discussed as some kind of nucleus of remodeler, and the general view is that it's recruited, that it likes to sniff and so on and so forth. But it turns out it's not true. Risk has specific DNA binding determinants. And the UASG has specific sites to which risk binds. So what happens is, risk binds to these specific sites on the UASG, holds the, holds the UASG in a specific conformation, and that very precise positioning causes the neighboring nucleosomes to be flanked, to be phased with hypersensitive sites between them, and it means that GAL4 can bind very quickly. So now what happens if you take it away, which you can do either by inactivating risk or by mutating those sites in the UASG? The answer is that now the nucleosomes just sort of bind in general. And what difference does that make? Well, under most conditions, it makes no difference at all. There is a condition under which it matters, and it's because, in fact, if you actually do the experiment, if you actually do the experiment, see, here are the risk binding sites, uh, you'll see that actually, GAL4 binds more quickly if the nucleosome is in a specific position presenting the UASG than if it's just blocked. And that turns out to mean that if you take cells growing in one condition, glucose, where there's no GAL4, and you put them into lactose where GAL4 has to be made, there's a big delay before the gene gets turned out. So another, again, something you never see if you were doing the experiments overnight. And it also shows the danger of all these, these genome experiments. I mean, guys, excuse me for saying that. But it's just ridiculous. You know, they say, oh, the nucleosomes are in the right place. Well, the fact is that a nucleosome that's going to want to bind somewhere is going to bind modulo 10 base pairs all over the region. That's how nucleosomes bind. They're not like specific DNA binding proteins. They only bind in a specific site if they're held there. And that's what this risk thing does. It holds the thing in a specific site. And that accounts for all the features of the chromatin architecture. And it tells you what happens. And by the way, GAL4, I told you, works in the main and cells. Mammals don't have this form of risk. And an experiment shows that, in fact, the nucleosomes are just at random over the UASG. So every time you use GAL4 to turn on a gene that flies, you know, it's to help some puffs, but finally it gets there. If it had a risk thing, it would, would work quicker and be an add-on. probably doesn't matter. And in fact, it could turn out. We suspect it's going to turn out that in higher organisms, you never have these special things. Uh, and, and you just don't care because you're not in that much of a hurry. All these things are slow. And by the way, Rick, <laughs> um, cohesion binds the risk. Think that over. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>